One of the longest political and military disputes in British history, the Mardist War, was fought between the colonial power and a rebellion led by Islamic fundamentalists across the deserts of Northeast Africa. Following a humiliating defeat at Khartoum in 1885, a stalemate would ensue for the next 11 years, at which point the British would return to Sudan to claim the territory for their own, while at the same time dislodging the remnants of the Mahdi's oppressive religious caliphate. The background to Britain's involvement in the Mahdist War began in the mid-1800s, with the creation of the Suez Canal between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, a vital link between Europe and the colonies of India and the Far East that shaved weeks off the previous journey time around South Africa. The creation of the Suez Canal, however, required the cooperation of the Egyptian government, who officially owned the canal itself, but was operated through a concessionary company dubbed the Suez Canal Company, that was supported by European shareholders. By the 1870s, in order to gain more influence over the Egyptian government so as to ensure the continued operation of the canal, the European powers had provided the Khedive of Egypt, Ismail Pasha, significant loans that he struggled to repay, leading to economic stagnation and a general mismanagement of the Egyptian state, which created bitter resentment. Thus, in 1879, when Ismail Pasha attempted to rise up against the influence of the Europeans, the British government colluded with Sultan Abdul Hamid II to have him deposed, and was replaced as the Khedive by the more pro-colonist Tufik Pasha. Tufik thus gave the Europeans a greater ability to dominate the ruling classes of Egypt, with the majority of the most important businesses in the country being either owned directly or through holding firms by British and French concerns, again leading to a nationalist sentiment simmering into open hostility. The result was the Urabi Revolt of September 1881, as led by Colonel Ahmed Urabi, who demanded the establishment of a constitution, a change in the government, the creation of a new parliament, and to strengthen the Egyptian army. In order to protect their assets in Egypt, together with the canal, the British launched an invasion between July and September 1882, bombarding Alexandria and then moving inland so as to secure control of the nation. Following the overwhelming victory of the British in Egypt, the nation became a protectorate of the British Empire, with Khedive Tufik holding a nominal position as ruler, though in reality he answered directly to the government in London. This, therefore, brought the British to within easy reach of Sudan to the south, which itself was part of Turco-Egyptian Sudan as conquered by the Ottomans, but now ruled by the Khedive of Egypt, though due to its lack of strategic importance, the colonial government had little concern for matters in this nation. However, British rules of governance had extended to this region through the Khedive for at least a decade prior to the Arabi Revolt, examples including the complete abolition of the slave trade at the insistence of the UK government. Colonel Charles George Gordon, Governor-General of the Sudan, was dispatched to personally oversee the elimination of the slave trade between 1873 and 1880 in direct service of the Khedive, with influential slavers being executed, merchants put out of business, and local tribal revolts suppressed. Following Gordon's departure from Sudan in 1880, though, local Egyptian authorities lacked direction and political strength from Cairo in order to maintain his policies, and gradually the slave trade returned quietly to the nation, though not in the same magnitude as what had been present before. Thus, the extremely weak government of Sudan was ripe to be overthrown, its problems exacerbated further by the demoralized Sudanese army, that was generally leaderless and very ill-equipped. It was in this that Mohammed Ahmed, a charismatic political and religious leader, proclaimed himself the Mahdi, or the expected one, during 1881, the Mahdi being prophesied as the redeemer of Islam and declared jihad or holy war against the corrupt and wealthy government of Egypt and the colonists. Initially, the threat of the Mahdi was not taken seriously by the Sudanese authorities, though this changed quickly during 1882, when his supporters, armed only with spears and swords, overwhelmed a British-led 7,000-man Egyptian force not far from Al-Ubayid, taking possession of their rifles, field guns and ammunition, followed by a siege of Al-Abuayid itself until it was starved into submission four months later. Initially, the revolt of the Mahdi, who now led a force of 30,000 men, was ignored by the colonial government in Cairo as merely an Egyptian problem, with British Colonel William Hicks commander-in-chief of the Egyptian forces in Khartoum, leading an 8,000-man expeditionary force into the desert to root out the rebellion. 
However, after being dragged through the waterless wastes of Kordofan in a vain attempt to engage the Mukti, his forces were ambushed at the Battle of Sheikhan by 40,000 Mahdists who easily crushed the Egyptian army, leaving only 300 survivors, while Hicks was impaled with a spear and his head taken as a trophy. Despite the death of Hicks leading to a public outrage in Britain, the government of Prime Minister William Gladstone remained reluctant to become directly involved in the desert war with the Mahdi, continuing to maintain that the problem was merely an Egyptian one. Therefore, General Gordon was dispatched to Khartoum in order to evacuate the Egyptian garrisons from the city, and thereby essentially leave the Sudan to its fate under the rule of the Mahdi, with Gordon arriving down the Nile in February 1884. Once in Khartoum, though, Gordon realized quickly that the garrison could not be extricated, and called for reinforcements to be sent down the Nile to relieve the city, the general also recommending that al Zubair, a former slaver and enemy of Gordon, be named to succeed him as leader of the Sudanese in opposition to the Mahdi, though London rejected this proposal. After this, Gordon refused to retreat from the city, using his defiance of Parliament's direct orders to emphasize that, should the Mahdi gain control of Sudan, his radicalist movement would spread rapidly across North Africa and potentially threaten Egypt's security, this move gaining him huge popular support among the British people. Eventually, the British government relented and dispatched a relief force under Lord Garnet Joseph Wolseley, which took the form of two divisions, a flying column sent overland from Wadi Haifa to provide immediate reinforcements, and the main attack squadron sent down the Nile itself. However, the flying column became bogged down in skirmishes against the Mahdist forces in the desert, while the main force, arriving in Khartoum on January 28, 1885, found the garrison had been slaughtered two days earlier, once the flooding Nile had receded, allowing the Mahdi's troops to assault the poorly defended river approach to the city. In the slaughter, the entire fighting force, as well as 4,000 civilians, were slain by the Mahdi's army, including Gordon whose cause of death is uncertain but often romanticized, the general's head being taken to the Mahdi as a prize and his body dumped in the Nile. However, despite Gordon's brutal death in Khartoum and the demands of a baying UK public to have his murder avenged, the expeditionary force was withdrawn soon after, with Gladstone's government still determined not to become bogged down in a costly war in the Sudan. As for the Mahdi himself, he proclaimed himself ruler of most parts of what is now Sudan and South Sudan, establishing a religious state dubbed the Madia. Though only six months after his victory at Khartoum, Muhammad Ahmed died in June 1885 of what was believed to be typhoid, and his new religious state passed to his chosen successor, Abdali bin Muhammad. Back in Britain, the failure in the Sudan was an extremely costly one both in terms of financial and political ramifications. The campaign against the Mahdi having expended £11.5 million of the British military budget, while Gladstone's perceived blunder earned him the displeasure of both the ruling class and the public of the UK, even receiving a rebuke from Queen Victoria in the form of a letter, forcing his resignation and the collapse of his government in June 1885. In the wake of the Mahdi's death in 1885, the task of establishing and maintaining a government in what was formerly Sudan fell to his deputies, a trio of caliphs chosen by Muhammad Ahmed in emulation of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, though this led quickly to bitter rivalry as each of the three caliphs worked in support of their native people. This instability would last until 1891, when Abdali bin Muhammad, with the help of the Bakara Arabs, overcame the opposition and emerged as unchallenged leader of Mahdiya. Abdali, known formally as the Khalifa or successor, seeking to establish his own power base, through the removal of what were considered the old guard, namely the family of Muhammad Ahmed, as well as his earliest religious disciples. Ultimately, the Khalifa would bring the various regions of Mahdiya into line and establish an administration, though political ties between the various peoples of the state remained incredibly tense, due to his insistence on maintaining jihad to extend his vision of Islam throughout the world, rejecting a political alliance with Emperor Johannes IV of Ethiopia against the Europeans purely on religious grounds. This led to an extremely wasteful invasion of Ethiopia during 1887, as while the Khalifa's forces captured substantial booty and prisoners for slaves, as well as killing the Emperor Johannes during the Battle of Galabat, it expended much of Mahdiya's resources, compounded further by the fact that the religious state had a generally non-functioning economy. To try and regain his reputation, 
The Khalifa launched further invasions against British Egypt, Belgian Equatoria, now the Congo, and Italian Eritrea, all of which were repulsed, the defeats only serving to end the myth of the invincibility of the Mahdi's followers. The end of the Khalifa's campaigns against the neighbours of Madia meant he focused instead on the establishment of a stable government, implementing taxes and policies throughout its territories, much to the chagrin of the Sudanese people, as many locals had joined the Mahdists to gain autonomy while removing a centralist and oppressive government. Rebellions soon broke out against the Khalifa's rule due to the preference of certain ethnic groups within Madia, the main resistance being led by religious leader Abu Jameza of the Tama tribe in western Darfur, which was supported by the bordering states as a means of destabilizing the Mahdist government. By 1892, seeing the weakness of the Mahdist government, Herbert Kitchener, now commander of the Egyptian army, started preparations for the reconquest of Sudan, primarily fueled by colonial priorities against other European powers, with the French and Belgians also converging at the Nile headwaters. The British fears were primarily based on Belgian and French aspirations to claim Sudan following their previous inability to annex territory in Egypt, while at the same time wanting to establish control over the Nile to safeguard a planned irrigation dam at Aswan. Eventually, in 1896, the British launched their invasion of Madia at the behest of the Italians, who suffered a heavy defeat at the Battle of Adwa in northern Abyssinia on March 1st of that year, with over 6,000 Italian troops killed and 4,000 taken prisoner, while also threatening their colony of Eritrea due to its diminished defence force. Under the rule of Prime Minister Lord Salisbury, the commitment of British troops to northern Sudan was done as a means of distracting the Mahdist army from their Italian campaign, the British advance being supported by the rapid construction of the Sudan Military Railway by Canadian engineer Edouard Giroard of the Royal Engineers. Knowing well the remoteness of the region, and having learned from their mistakes in 1885, Kitchener was determined to ensure that his forces were given a consistent resupply, and thus for every movement south made by the British army, the railway would follow thus providing a vital link to the Egyptian ports with the fastest possible shipment time. The main attack force comprised 9,000 men, the vast majority of whom were Egyptian and Sudanese, although 900 men were from the North Staffordshire Regiment and the Connaught Rangers, which employed the use of Maxim machine guns. May 1st, 1896, saw the first clash between Kitchener's army and the Mahdists occur at Akasha, with three squadrons of Egyptian cavalry, facing off against 1,300 Mahdist footmen and 300 horsemen, leading to a muddled first blood that saw the Egyptians struggle to repel the Mahdists until relief arrived in the form of a battalion of Sudanese infantry. Two columns were subsequently assembled to move south into Madia, one travelling by river aboard luxury steamers requisitioned from the Thomas Cook Company, and a desert column that travelled by camel, the river column advancing to Firkut along the Nile, while the desert column headed towards the east with both columns expected to arrive at Firkut at the same time for the attack. Firkut was assaulted on June 7th, during which a two-pronged attack from both the river and the desert put the Mahdist warriors to flight within two hours, and the town was captured at the cost of only 20 Allied losses against 1,000 Mahdists. The regional capital of Dongola would fall on September 23rd, the capture of which gave Lord Salisbury the impression that any further movement into Madia was unnecessary and that the Khalifa's army had now been left in disarray. Kitchener, however, demanded that the invasion continue further into Sudan, primarily due to the fact that he did not want to leave the Egyptian army to stagnate in Dongola, while the Mahdist forces regrouped in the desert, though limited funds from the Egyptian government threatened to halt any further advance. Eventually, following word that Frenchman Jean-Baptiste Marchand was set to conduct an expedition to the Upper Nile, the British agreed to pay for all expenses when it came to the Egyptian campaign, giving Kitchener carte blanche to move his army further south into Mahdist territory. Nearly a year after the fall of Dongola, the Egyptian force clashed with the Mahdists again at Abu Hamed on August 7, 1897, with Major General Archibald Hunter leading three Egyptian infantry battalions and one Sudanese that was supported by British artillery, Maxims and cavalry. Against a force of 1,350 Mahdist footmen, a crushing victory for Hunter's army ensued, and Abu Hamid was captured with the loss of only 23 Allied troops against 450 Mahdist warriors. Nine months later, on April 8, 1898, a far more serious action took place during the Battle of Atbara, 
when Kitchener, commanding four brigades of infantry, including one British and three Egyptian, were involved in a heavy assault of a Mahdist Sariba near the Atbara River, the latter commanded by Mahmud Ahmed. This was the first action that saw a majority British force do battle against the Mahdists, with the battle ending in victory for Kitchener, although Anglo-Egyptian losses were high, including 82 killed and 478 wounded, while Mahmud's losses were estimated at 3,000 killed. The most important battle of the campaign, though, came on September 2nd, 1898, during the Battle of Omdurman, when Kitchener advanced towards Omdurman and made camp at Agega on the banks of the Nile, protecting his force through the construction of a zariba. The Battle of Omdurman comprised three phases, the first being the Mahdist attack of Kitchener's force within the zariba, where thousands of warriors charged towards the Anglo-Egyptian troops, only to be gunned down by rifle and maxim fire, as supported by artillery and gunboats on the Nile. With the attack repulsed, this was followed by the charge of the 21st Lancers against a group of Mahdist warriors, though this ultimately led the British cavalrymen into a trap organised by Osman Dinga, resulting in a virtual disaster that saw heavy casualties among both men and horses, one of the survivors of this doomed charge being a young Lieutenant Winston Churchill. With the failure of the Lancers, Kitchener recommenced his advance, during which the Mahdists again attacked, though another disaster was nearly avoided when Brigadier General Hector MacDonald's 1st Egyptian Brigade became separated from the main body of the Anglo-Egyptian forces, and was made to stand against the overwhelming 20,000-strong army of Mahdist warriors, though MacDonald's men were able to successfully maintain their defence. The final phase of the battle commenced when Jakob Mohammed Tershan committed the Black Flag, a Mahdist reserve force, into battle, this time hoping to overwhelm and destroy MacDonald's beleaguered brigade defeat coming very close during this action, though MacDonald was eventually relieved by soldiers of the Lincolnshire Regiment that sent the Mahdist warriors into retreat. In the wake of the Battle of Omdurman, the city was taken and the Khalifa was forced to flee into the desert, the outcomes of the battle being 45 killed and 425 wounded for the Allies, while the Mahdists saw an estimated 10,800 killed, 15,000 wounded and 5,000 taken prisoner. The Khalifa was therefore defeated, and the Caliphate of Madia was placed under the rule of the Sultanate of Darfur, as occupied by Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Though the Khalifa himself continued to wield significant influence across the desert tribes and maintained his rebellion against the British from his stronghold in Kordofan. Ultimately, Abdali bin Muhammad, as the sole Khalifa of Sudan after the Mahdi himself, was killed in the Battle of Umm Duwakarat on November 25, 1899 though this wouldn't completely spell the end of the Mahdist cause, with holdouts continuing to resist Anglo-Egyptian rule until January 1900. As for the Sudanese, the defeat of Mahdia by the Anglo-Egyptian forces was celebrated across the nation, as under the regime of the Khalifa, the economy of the country had been destroyed, while approximately one half of the population had died from famine, disease, persecution and warfare, accounting for millions of people during the 14-year reign of the Mahdist government. Additionally, all of the country's traditional institutions and loyalties have been swept away, leading to strong and irreparable divisions between the tribes that have been split in their opinions towards Mahdism, with their ancient religious brotherhoods having been weakened and orthodox religious leaders abolished. Anglo-Egyptian rule of the Sudan would last until the 1950s, as though Britain had granted independence to Egypt in the wake of the 1919 Egyptian Revolution, the terms of the legal instrument regarding said independence reserved judgment on the matter of Sudan, meaning the British would increase their control in the country and practically abolish the Egyptian authorities by the mid-1920s. This led to strong and bitter resentment against the British in both Egypt and Sudan, and in the wake of the 1952 Egyptian Revolution, that overthrew King Farouk only six months after he had declared himself King of Egypt and the Sudan, political pressure against the Suez Canal Company by the revolutionary government of Gamal Abdel Nassar eventually led to the British relinquishing control of the country on January 1st, 1956, creating the Independent Republic of Sudan.